In Halloween Ends, we see a Laurie Strode who is trying to find some normalcy in her life. She needs to overcome her past by celebrating Halloween like a normal person, rather than going to war with Michael Myers. To do this, we see her carve a pumpkin, a holiday activity she took part in when we first met her in 1978. Back then, it was her, Tommy, and Lindsay, and this time she's with Allison and Lindsay. Later on, we get a look at the finished product, and it looks just like the one she carved all those years ago. I guess her style hasn't changed much over the last 44 years. We also see this in her attire. In the original film, she had this long brim hat in her room, which she held onto until 2018, where it would have been destroyed in the fire. Ironically, when she burns her pie in Halloween Ends, you can spot a replacement hat near the front door. Another trait from Lori's past that persevered is the way she twirls her hair when she thinks about her crush. In the original, she did this while discussing the target of her high school affection, Ben Tramer. And now, 44 years later, she reacts similarly when running into Frank Hawkins at the supermarket. Maybe you didn't notice those details when you first watched the movie, so in this video, I'm gonna go over everything you might have missed in Halloween Ends. From tiny details in newspapers to the broader meaning of the entire film. Stick around to the end of this video. This video is brought to you by Established Titles. Welcome to Things You Missed. We once again find ourselves at the end of the line here on the Halloween Express. I'm glad to see one of these timelines actually have a definitive ending for once. You could argue that Rob Zombie's timeline was definitive, but Halloween Ends leaves little to the imagination. No matter what you think about this movie, you have to give the filmmaker David Gordon Green and writer Danny McBride credit for finishing what they started. Every good story has a beginning, middle, and end, even when it does include a timeless character like Michael Myers. This story has come to an end, but like every great legend, it can always be reimagined for future generations. While the story may have come to an end, there are still many more things you might have missed to slash our way through. So let's slide into our next one. The opening song of the movie, Midnight Monsters Hop, has lyrics that describe a concert with many classic Halloween monsters like Dracula, the Invisible Man, Frankenstein, and the Mummy, who started as pop culture icons like Michael Myers but are now eternal urban legends. These are classic Universal monsters, and this trilogy of Halloween films was made by Universal's Blumhouse, so it's almost as if Michael Myers is following in their footsteps. The opening titles are done in the same style as the titles from Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, the black sheep of the franchise. This made me realize that there's a pattern. Halloween 2018 was the first Blumhouse Halloween, and it mimics the titles from Halloween 1. Halloween Kills was the second Blumhouse Halloween, and its titles resemble Rick's Halloween 2. Ends is the third of the Blumhouse trilogy, so it took on the style of Halloween 3. The opening scene shows our new character, Cory, babysitting for this kid named Jeremy. As the parents are about to leave, I noticed the mom holding a small drone. It reminded me of the scene from Halloween Kills, where Michael destroys Sandra's drone just before attacking her and her husband. But I don't think this drone is a callback, because shortly after, we see that Jeremy prefers playing with paper airplanes. He has access to the newest technology, but still chooses the old classic. We also see Lori playing with the paper plane when she confronts Cory later on. It seems symbolic for a movie with two main antagonists, the old classic, Michael Myers, and the newcomer, Cory Cunningham. Cory just ends up modeling himself after Michael, so once again, the original can't be beat. It's Halloween. We're gonna have a good time tonight. Thank God he didn't say everyone's entitled to one good scare. Corey and Jeremy end up watching John Carpenter's The Thing, which is a remake of The Thing from Another World, which Lori and Tommy watched in the original. It's significant that they chose John Carpenter's The Thing because as you may know, John Carpenter directed the original Halloween and Halloween Ends honors more of his filmography. In particular, Ends is more of a remake of John Carpenter's 1983 film Christine than it is a Halloween sequel. In Halloween Ends, we follow a character named Corey Cunningham, who is an obvious homage to Christine's main character, Arnie Cunningham. Spoilers for Christine until the end of this chapter. Arnie starts off as kind of a loser until he buys this old car named Christine and decides to fix it up. As he does so, he becomes cooler and starts to stand up for himself against his bullies and his overly strict parents. The car is actually a supernatural entity with the ability to repair herself and go after Arnie's enemies on her own. Owning this car changes his personality and grows his ego, but it goes too far and Arnie becomes a villain, willing to attack those that care about him when they show concern about the evil car. In Halloween Ends, Corey starts as an outcast because of his babysitting accident. Like Arnie, he gets his glasses broken by high school bullies, and his life is dominated by his strict mother, but his luck starts to change when he receives this motorcycle from his stepdad, with the promise that he can fix it up. Corey works at Prevo Auto, which looks like a smaller version of Darnell's garage where Arnie fixes up Christine. I found it interesting that Prevo Auto was established in 1963, the same year that Michael seemingly became evil and killed his older sister. It's like there's this parallel between Michael and the junkyard, which is appropriate because Corey's motorcycle is not the Christine of this movie. Michael Myers is Christine. Let me explain. Corey is always said to be a good kid who had a bad break. Even the father of the boy that he killed admits that Jeremy's death was an accident, but something else later seemed to send Corey down a dark path. 
It is true that this happens right after he gets the motorcycle, but it's around the same time that he first encounters Michael Myers. Like Christine, Michael Myers is in a sad state when we first encounter him, and Corey, like Arnie, develops a strange fascination with him. Christine seems to have Arnie under some kind of trance as soon as he lays eyes on her, and Halloween Ends features this moment where Corey and Michael first make eye contact, and something non-verbal seems to be passed between them. Christine seems to regain her power after Arnie spends countless hours fixing her up in the garage, and in Michael's case, he seems to regain power after Corey brings him a new victim. The way Christine puts herself back together even kind of resembles the way that Michael visually regains his mojo after taking a life. In each film, the Cunningham character gains more confidence and swagger after their first encounter with the supernatural. They both ditch their glasses, because not wearing glasses instantly makes you more attractive in a movie. Hey man, no glasses. You're looking good. Arnie Cunningham starts dating the most coveted girl in the school, and Christine tries to kill her by locking her in the cabin when she starts choking. Corey Cunningham meets and begins to date Allison, who is similarly an enemy of Michael. Arnie stops listening to his mother and stops respecting his parents, and Corey does the same. Finally, Christine is totaled by bullies, so after getting fixed, she goes after them and hunts them down. Each time, we see the bright headlights blasting them before Christine chases them down and kills them. In Halloween, the bullies try to ruin Corey's motorcycle, and he confronts them by targeting them in the bright lights of the tow truck before running them down. It's definitely paying tribute to that iconic Christine shot. In the end, Arnie's best friend and ex-girlfriend battle and defeat Christine in the auto garage, where she's compacted and dumped in the junkyard, but they're unable to save Arnie. While in Halloween Ends, Lori and Allison also defeat Michael and bring him to the junkyard to be destroyed, but they are unable to save Corey. There's also a cameo in this movie from Diana Prince, who is known in the horror community as the co-host of The Last Drive-In. One of Christine's iconic scenes takes place at a drive-in movie. There was talk earlier this year of Christine getting its own Blumhouse remake, which Stephen King, the author of the novel, was not thrilled about, so I'm hoping Halloween Ends is instead of that. Because I think I prefer this weird amalgamation of two John Carpenter movies to a remake of a movie that still holds up and doesn't really need to be remade. Plus, Stephen King liked it. Seriously, Blumhouse, quit while you're ahead. After meeting Corey, we move on to Lori, who has a collection of newspapers pinned to our wall which contain a few things you might have missed. Established titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. The project is based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds, or lords and ladies in English. You can buy a title pack ranging from as much as 10 square feet to as little as one square foot of land, and with each order, they will plant a tree, your tree, and work with global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. Which is what we need, because the earth is really screwed right now. You'll receive a title with a unique plot number on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, and an official certificate with a crest. But the best part is, I have made arrangements with established titles so that the first 200 people to purchase a title with my link will be placed effectively next to my plot, meaning that you can help CZ's world become a real physical place. And considering it will be all trees and no cars, it will be the greatest kingdom of all time. You can officially include the title Lord or Lady on your credit card, plane tickets, or dating profiles. It makes an amazing last minute gift. Established Titles is actually running a massive early Black Friday sale right now. Plus, you can use the code CZ's World and get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash CZ's World to get your gifts now and help support the channel. One thing Halloween Ends does really well is foreshadowing, which makes it a joy to watch for your second and third viewing. There are many covert clues about Corey's transition to evil and alignment with Michael Myers. In my Michael Myers Horror History episode, I talked all about how Michael seems to be stuck in a childlike mindset because of his trauma at six years old. Corey seems to have that same mindset, which can be seen in his beverage of choice. In the opening, he's confronted with a choice between chocolate milk and beer, and he goes with chocolate milk. Then again at the gas station, he chooses milk and refuses to buy beer for the kids pressuring him in the parking lot. Beer is obviously an adult beverage, you have to be 21 to drink it in the US, while milk is considered to be beneficial for growing children, but the lactase enzyme responsible for digesting it goes away in most adults. I also noticed that Corey's mom drinks milk with her spaghetti, and she definitely has some weird issues. Another example of foreshadowing can be seen in Corey's actual shadow as he heads up the stairs. It looks like the silhouette of Michael Myers, which we saw before in Halloween 6. As I mentioned, Corey is a mechanic, and we see him in his work uniform early on, which happens to be the same costume that Michael Myers wears. He's also seen using the blowtorch, which he would later weaponize against the leader of the bullies, Terry, in a pretty awesome kill. When Corey and Allison hang out on the rooftop of the radio station, he claims he's not interested in immortality and drops down to the ground, falling on his back. He appears to be hurt, then sits up in the same fashion that Michael always sits up after a recharge period. Corey's death, or at least his apparent death, is also foreshadowed during the dance party scene. He's laying on the dance floor for some reason, and Allison runs her hands along his face and neck. At the end, when Allison comes home to discover Corey's self-inflicted injury, 
she finds herself in the same position. Outside of hints about Cory, there are also other aspects of the movie that are set up. The recap at the beginning uses a shot from the original Halloween of Laurie attacking Michael with her knitting needle. Most of us have seen the original Halloween, but it's a nice touch to include that for those who haven't because it foreshadows the moment later in Halloween Ends. We even see that she still knits, so it makes more sense when she finds the needle and uses it as a weapon in the final battle. There are many aspects of the final showdown that are set up earlier on, like the scene where Laurie burns her pumpkin pie. This shows us the location of the fire extinguisher, so it's more satisfying when she gets it and uses it in the finale. Similarly, there's a scene where Allison leaves her meal in the microwave for too long and it explodes. Laurie later does this on purpose as a loud noise that can distract Michael. <laughs> then, when Laurie tries to warn her granddaughter about Corey, she uses the following words. I'm not gonna let this happen to you. You have to believe me. Which are the first words out of Allison's mouth when she comes back to save her grandmother. I'm not gonna let this happen to you. And the last thing I'm gonna point out as far as foreshadowing is how they foreshadowed Michael's death. One of the first things that we ever see at the junkyard is that industrial shredder. It's very brief, but it's a nice setup. It's shown again later on, but my favorite might be the butcher at the grocery store. Three pound of brown chip, right here on top. Is that a little clue that Michael is eventually going to become ground beef himself? The procession scene right before Michael's body is destroyed is a great way to wrap up the trilogy because it allows us to see many of the characters who made it all the way through, like Sheriff Barker, the graveyard caretaker Sandra Larson, and the snarky kid Julian Morrissey. Each of these characters appeared in all three movies and survived till the end. We even see WCZD make one last appearance. Nice. Let's move on to the Easter eggs. Some Halloween fans may remember the Halloween novelization. These books were not canon, but gave fans a little more detail about their favorite Halloween stories, characters, and lore. The novelization of the original Halloween has details about what became of Judith and Michael's parents after losing their kids, where they are given names for the first time, Donald Myers and Edith Myers. These names are referenced in Halloween Ends in an article pinned to Laurie Strode's wall titled Six-Year-Old Kills Teen Sister in Halloween Tragedy. You can see their names from the novelization are now canon. There's also an obituary section revealing the name of Linda's mother, Marilyn Vanderklok. This is also a name taken from the novelization. Then again, you might not want to trust the newspapers. This article, titled Myers Manhunt Underway, states that Michael had 27 victims in 2018. It's not entirely clear who lived and who died, but if you tally up all of the victims from Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills, you would get a number somewhere in the 50s. I like to think this article was written before all the bodies had been discovered, but there's no excuse you can make for this next part, where it says that in 1978, Michael killed five teenagers, with Laurie Strode being the only sole survivor. This is just not true. Michael killed three teenagers that year, and Laurie was one of four survivors, alongside Tommy, Lindsay, and Dr. Loomis. There's one more potential error here, where it says that Michael was last seen at 45 Lampkin Lane in Haddonfield. In my Halloween Kills episode, I talked about how the address of the Myers house is 709 Lampkin Lane, with 45 Lampkin Lane being mistake made in Rick's Halloween 2, which is not part of this timeline. It is possible, though, that there's a neighbor who actually does live at 45 Lampkin Lane who was the last one to spot Michael. Maybe that's what this article is talking about. As long as we're taking a closer look at these articles, let's look at this one. Nightblade Landmark Destroyed. Nightblade was a working title for Halloween 2018 during the early stages of production, and the film was made under the company name Nightblade Holdings LLC. Halloween Kills followed suit, with the company name being Nightblade 2 Holdings, and Ends was made by Nightblade 3 Holdings. But this article was not the only instance of the behind-the-scenes content being in the scenes themselves. This hobo is a cameo by Christopher Nelson, the special effects makeup designer for the trilogy. You may remember I pointed out his other cameo in Halloween 2018, where he played a police officer. Deborah Hill, who produced on the original three Halloween movies, is sadly no longer around to make a cameo appearance, but there is a nurse character named Deb who seems to be a tribute to her. During the production of the original Halloween, she was dating John Carpenter, and the character Deb is secretly dating the man calling the shots at the clinic, Dr. Mathis. Of course, Deb's death is a direct retread of a famous death from the original movie. Throughout Halloween Ends, Lori can be seen writing a book in order to help her cope with the horrible events that she's endured. This is almost certainly a nod to her fellow final girl, Sydney Prescott, who has a similar coping strategy in Scree form. Yes, that is the correct pronunciation based on the spelling, Scree for M. The relationship between Halloween and Scream began in 1996 in the original Scream, where Halloween was shown to guests at a party. In 1998, Halloween H2O showed Scream 2 on a dorm room TV. Then in 2000, Scream 3 has a scene where Sydney's mother says she'll protect her from the boogeyman which is a name that is interchangeable with Michael Myers in the Halloween franchise. In Scree form, Sydney is introduced as the ultimate Scream Queen beyond Jamie Lee Curtis, the actress who plays Laurie, among a variety of other references. So I believe Laurie's transformation into a self-help author is a reference to the fourth Scream. Her book is titled Stalkers, Saviors, and Samhain. 
Samhain. Samhain is the Gaelic festival marking the end of the harvest season in Celtic Ireland, which is a big part of the lore in Halloween 2, 3, and 6. You can watch my episodes on each of those movies if you want to know more, but the appearance here on Laurie's book title is an easter egg waiting to be noticed by fans of the originals. There's another reference to Celtic folklore in the song that the homeless man sings after Cory is thrown off the overpass. You've got to listen pretty carefully to pick up on it. If you couldn't hear that, he says, there's a hole in the boat and it won't stay afloat, Oilyphiest in the sea. This song is called Oilyphiest Fear Thee. The Oilyphiest is a mythological sea serpent creature originating in Irish mythology. The rest of the song may also be significant. Now my hands turn the door. At the end of the movie, Michael's hands are nailed down with knives and his knees are trapped down by the refrigerator, so this line might be connected to that. But there are still a ton more Easter eggs, referencing other films in the franchise, and I'm gonna talk about how Halloween Ends has a message about COVID-19 and what the director meant when he said that Haddonfield is gonna be dealing with the pandemic in Halloween Ends. There's a four year gap in between the end of Halloween Kills and the main events of Halloween Ends, during which Allison graduates, gets a job, and starts dating a police officer named Doug Mullaney. This character is most likely a descendant of the Mullaney's from the flashback in Halloween Kills. It's what you get when you f with the Mullaney's. Looks like their family motto got passed down as well. Hey! I gotta admit, I spent way too long trying to figure out who the Mullaney's were supposed to be in Kills and did not consider that it might be a setup for the next movie. Another connection to Kills can be seen right here in the graffiti, which reads, Love Lives Today. The same text seen on the donation box back at Mick's Bar, which helped inspire everybody's favorite line from that middle chapter. Love Lives Today. But evil dies tonight. Next to the Love Lives Today graffiti is just the word kills, in case we forgot the name of the previous title. And there's also some artwork of Michael Myers, which might be of note because the police procession goes down the same street before Michael's execution at the end. And speaking of the ending, it also has a couple of Halloween Kills references. After pinning Michael to the kitchen island, Laurie shows him his own reflection in the knife, probably to test Deputy Hawkins' theory from the last movie. Maybe he wasn't looking out. Maybe he was looking in at his reflection at himself. And when Michael gets the upper hand, she yells, do it, in a way that almost looks like she's encouraging him to kill her. Do it. Do it. Of course, she's really talking to Allison, who is standing behind Michael and comes in to rescue her. This mirrors the scene in Kills, where Allison is at Michael's mercy and yells, do it, but she's really talking to her mother, who is standing at the door with a pitchfork. I find it interesting that in order to stop Michael, Lori pins him down to the kitchen island, because in Halloween 2018, she had a much more elaborate trap for him under her kitchen island. But the simpler trap ends up being more effective. Halloween 2018 also shares another similar line with ends. At one point, Cory comes over to visit Allison late at night, and he's extremely Fluster. She tries to calm him down by saying, look at me. The same tactic her mother once used to try to calm down Lori during her panic attack at the Honor Society dinner. Look at me. Mom, look at me. Another 2018 connection is visible when Allison pulls up at the restaurant that she's meeting Cory at. The sign out front advertises banh mi sandwiches, the same type of sandwich that the cop stationed outside of Lori's house was raving about four years prior. Now, a banh mi sandwich. Banh mi is essentially just the Vietnamese version of a French baguette. Outside of the 40 year trilogy, there are still plenty of other Halloween Easter eggs to uncover. I'll start with Halloween Resurrection and we can work our way backwards. When we first see Michael's new home in the sewers, there's an insert shot of the rats, which brings to mind Michael's lair in Resurrection where he lived underneath the house and fed on rats for sustenance. In Halloween H2O, there was a tense scene where the character Charlie drops a corkscrew into the garbage disposal and Michael sneaks up on him as he's reaching in for it, making it seem as if the boogeyman is gonna flip the switch and grind up Charlie's hand. That doesn't end up happening, but when Michael tries to force Lori's hand into the garbage disposal on Halloween ends, it's clearly an homage to that scene. There's also a part where Lori holds on to Michael's hand after trapping him, which reminded me a lot of the ending of H2O, where the masked man is trapped under the van and reaches out to Lori, where they briefly touch fingertips. This movie also features a radio host getting massacred during a broadcast, which we saw with Barry Sims in Halloween 6, a retaliation from an angry driver of a black convertible that got scratched, which we saw with Mikey in Halloween 5, an adult giving a teenager a loaded rifle and telling him to stay put, which we saw with Sheriff Meeker and Brady in Halloween 4, and a tow truck being stolen for a murderous rampage, as we saw Michael do in Halloween 4. As always, we get a ton of connections to the immortal classic, the 1978 original, Halloween. It starts when Laurie is talking to Hawkins in the supermarket, where you can hear the grocery store cover of Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult. Thanks. 
Thanks. I, uh... They must have watched my Chucky season one video where I ranted about how I don't dislike the song, but it's way overused in movies and TV because they proceeded to put it twice in this movie. It also plays over the end credits. That evening, when Allison and Corey go to the dance party, Corey bumps into this man played by Nick Castle, the actor under the Michael Myers mask in the original and also parts of 2018 and Kills. This Easter egg is actually a two-parter because he opens his jacket and asks, which is the same line Linda had in the original movie when flashing her tits to her boyfriend anything you like. Corey goes off on his own where he's jumped by a gang of bullies and tossed from the overpass. You can see Michael Myers in the background for just a moment before we pan down to see that Corey is alive. Lori first sees Corey's behavior start to change when she notices him peering out from behind a bush in the front yard. This isn't really a thing you missed because the shot in the original is so iconic, but people will complain if I don't mention it. A better one to bring up would be that night when Lori comes home to see Allison and Corey heading up to the bedroom through the front window. In the original, it was the young Michael Myers who caught a glimpse of his sister leading her boyfriend upstairs. This is a continuation of the trend that I talked about when covering Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills, where we are increasingly seeing the roles reversed between Lori and Michael to where she is becoming the hunter. Another detail I discussed in my 2018 video was Allison's outfit starting to look like the wardrobe that Lori wore in the original, and we see that again here in the radio tower scene, where she's wearing that very familiar blue button-up in jeans. We also see Lori wearing pretty much the same thing in the finale. She first knows that Michael is back when she notices the open back door, which probably reminded her of the window that he came through in 78. As she did back then, she hides in a closet where she formulates a plan of attack. The very ending shows an array of still shots all around Lori's house. It's just like the ending of the original Halloween, but this time with no ominous breathing sounds. I've already brought up a few details that you might have missed from Halloween Ends soundtrack, so here are a couple more. The second song we hear at the dance party is Halloween by Dead Kennedys, whose lyrics mention a character dressed up like a clown for Halloween. Maybe this is a coincidence, but Michael's first costume in the first movie was a clown costume, and there have been many clown costume appearances in other Halloween movies. There are a couple other songs that reflect ideas expressed in the movie, like when Dr. Mathis gets home and puts on the song Tell Me With Your Eyes by Rob Galbraith. Eyes are often depicted in this movie to be indicators of good or evil. Lori says that she can see Michael in Corey's eyes. Roger, the father of the boy who got killed, also says when he looked into Corey's eyes, he could tell that he was down a dark path. When Corey first meets Michael, they make eye contact and something seems to be passed between them, during which we see a montage that includes a bunch of extreme close-up of Corey and Michael's eyes. Another more overt music choice is Burn It Down by Boy Harsher, which we hear when Corey and Allison are riding on the motorcycle. This is a reference to the conversation they had about their desires to get away from Haddonfield. After my mom and dad were killed, I just wanted to burn it all to the ground and get away from Haddonfield. They bring up this phrase a few more times throughout the rest of the runtime whenever they're talking about skipping town and this motorcycle scene takes place right before Corey finally convinces her to head out with him. But what is the deal with that piano melody that the characters keep playing over and over throughout the film? To answer that, we'll have to look back many years to one legendary composer. We first hear Mr. Allen perform Toccata in Fugue in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach in the opening sequence on Halloween night. Roger, Corey's here. This music choice makes sense because the song is most commonly associated with the classic vampire film Nosferatu, which, if you watch Things You Missed, you already know is where Michael Myers got his creepy sit-up move from. Remember how I talked about Corey's shadow on the staircase looking like Michael Myers? That also comes from Nosferatu, which helped inspire many films to this day. We hear these iconic notes repeated throughout Halloween Ends, when Allison first enters the abandoned Allen house, when Corey lets Laurie Strode slip away, and non-diegetically when Michael comes across Laurie and her new house. If you were following updates throughout the production of Halloween Ends, you may remember David Gordon Green talking about how the time jump in between Halloween Kills and Ends meant that Halloween Ends would take place during the COVID-19 pandemic. In an October 2021 interview with Uprox, he stated, not only do they have their immediate world affected by that trauma, having time to process that trauma, and that's a specific and immediate traumatic event in the community of Haddonfield, but then they also had a worldwide pandemic and peculiar politics and another million things that turned their world upside down. This statement made it seem like the movie was actually going to acknowledge COVID-19, and to be fair, it does acknowledge it. Despite the virus breaking out in late 2019, it didn't begin to affect life in the United States until 2020. The opening with Corey and Jeremy took place in October 2019, and then we see a montage of anguish during subsequent Halloween. As a side note, this montage contains a really dark detail. We see the mother of Oscar Berlucci, one of the victims in 2018, hanging in a devil costume, the same outfit that her son died in, almost as if to suggest that she was overcome with grief and she decided she could not go on. 
But we also see this crime scene in a Jeep where the coroner and crime scene photographer are both wearing masks, suggesting that this probably happened in October of 2020. But this is the only evidence in the movie that the pandemic began. So what did Gordon Green mean when he said that the people of Haddonfield had their worlds turned upside down by a worldwide pandemic? I don't believe he ever meant that COVID would be at the forefront of the story, but rather, it seems to be a big part of the subtext. Lori's whole character arc in this movie is about learning to move on from a traumatic event. She had to deal with 50-some people, including her own daughter, getting killed after she tried to warn everybody about the threats that was Michael Myers and nobody listened. It sounds a lot like the countless healthcare professionals who tried to sound the alarm about COVID-19. Nobody listened, 6.5 million people were killed, and that number is still rising. Throughout my Halloween Things You Missed series, I've talked about how many Halloween films reflect the culture and time period that they were made in. Halloween Ends is no different. There's never been a more impactful event in our lifetimes, and in this movie, Michael Myers serves as a stand-in instigator for the collective grief that we've all been dealing with. In fact, there are many instances where Michael is compared to a virus. There are constant worries about being infected, and his evil is literally referred to as being contagious. The suffering Michael caused became an infection passing on to people who never even crossed his path. It's contagious, right? The other kind of evil lives inside us, like a sickness or an infection. We even see characters trying to spin ridiculous narratives, like the idea that Michael was an innocent mental patient that Laurie pushed too far, causing him to snap. By the time of the movie, everybody seems desperate to blame something for the hurts that Michael caused. Did it come from a bat? Was it leaked from a lab? Does it really matter at this point? Laurie is our protagonist, and she's trying to learn to deal with the consequences of Michael Myers. It's all about this self-promise of hers that she's not gonna let fear rule her life anymore. She still has some safety precautions, as one should, but for the first time, we see her trying to get back to normal, putting up Halloween decorations, carving pumpkins, and not spending all of her time preparing to fight. She does all of this, despite it being generally accepted that Michael is still out there, and at times, we see her panic and revert back to the Lori that we saw in 2018. Her journey in this movie is trying to fully overcome that. That's why I find the ambiguous ending regarding the fate of Corey Cunningham to be kind of interesting. Near the end of the movie, we see that Corey has the ability to recover from would-be fatal injuries like Michael does, and we never see what happens to Corey. There are many scenes that imply that evil is part of a continuous cycle. Even if you find a way to defeat Michael Myers, there is always a new evil on the horizon, whether it's Corey or one of the other deplorable characters in Haddonfield. Right from the get-go, the opening credits this time show us a series of jack-o'-lanterns being born out of other jack-o'-lanterns, representing the cycle of evil being reborn. In one scene, Lindsay does a tarot card reading for Allison. Oh no, I got the death card. No, that's not bad on tarot. No, that just means a major phase is ending and a new one is about to begin. It seems to be talking about Allison starting a new relationship with Corey, but in the grand context of the movie, it's talking about one phase of evil ending with Michael and a new one beginning in Corey. A similar theme is expressed in Lori's writing. I'm hopeful with perspective that my experience will help others heal. You have to ask yourself, am I in control or do the elements control me? Life or death, suicide or cherry blossoms? Cherry blossoms in Japanese culture are the symbolic flower of spring, a time of renewal and the fleeting nature of life. We can literally see the cycle repeating itself in the movie. The old Myers house is demolished, but there just ends up being a new horror house in Haddonfield when the Allen house is abandoned after Jeremy's untimely death. But I think, whether we're talking about COVID or Michael Myers, the end of Laurie's memoir puts it best. I've said goodbye to my boogeyman, but the truth is evil doesn't die. It changes shape. And with that, I have analyzed everything you might have missed in the Halloween franchise. Except for the Rob Zombie duology, which I skipped over. I think Jimmy Champagne and I will cover those next Halloween. The playlist on the left is my full collection of episodes on the Halloween franchise. And if you love horror, I cover all kinds of horror here on this channel. Make sure you subscribe to CZ's World, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I will see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.